I just kind of wanted to uh, introduce the message here a little bit with a video clip and uh, uh, about uh, Albert Einstein. We're, we're close to the end of the first section uh, in, in Romans. And again, we're looking at uh, Paul's uh, principle of righteousness that we find in the book. And the first one is the, the condemnation uh, of God, the wrath of God to all, all people that we're all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then he supported that idea uh, with the, uh, maybe the rhetorical question of, uh, uh, but aren't there any excuses? And he's kind of made the case that there are no excuses. Keep in mind that uh, when Paul is going around uh, planning churches, the first place he goes is to major cities and to synagogues where he would debate from the scriptures. And he certainly had to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. And there might be a lot of... Uh, a lot of Jewish people that would uh, see that in the scriptures, but then he had this hurdle to overcome to show that not only was Jesus of Nazareth the Messiah, the Hamashiach, but he had to die on a cross for their sins. Now they believed that being Jewish enough was, uh, was enough to get them to heaven. If that wasn't enough, if they were male, they were circumcised. So last week we looked at the fact that we said there, was, uh, there can be a false confidence uh, for the religious person, no matter who, who he is. Uh, there's a lot of people sitting in churches across this country today that have a false confidence uh, in their salvation. They think going to church, going through a ceremony, whatever it might be, is enough. Paul says it's not enough, and then he uses the example of the ultimate religious uh, service uh, ceremony in terms of uh, a Jewish person, which would have been circumcision. And again, we quoted from some rabbinical sources at the time that clearly state they, they believe they're going to heaven if they were circumcised. There are people across this country that believe they're going to heaven because they were baptized as an infant. I mean, there's a lot of parallels here, but we need to be careful. Uh, he goes now to anticipate the next rhetorical question. And Paul's not, again, he's not making up these questions. These were the questions that he would have been asked over and over and over again. Somebody after the first service said, well, Paul sounds like a prosecuting attorney. I go, he is, and he, he finds everybody guilty. <laughs> and he lays out the evidence for it here. Uh, this, this is going to lead us to the only solution, the problem of dealing with universal sin, which is faith uh, in Jesus Christ. It's a problem that uh, Albert Schweitzer uh, 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 dealt with himself. Excuse me, Albert Einstein. As a child, Albert Einstein was fascinated with a compass. Watching the steady northward pull of the needle, he said there must be something behind things, something deeply hidden. He wanted to find that something. As an adult, he devoted his life to physics in the attempt to understand the laws of the universe. He studied light, motion, gravity, space, time, electromagnetism. He developed the quantum theory. He was awarded the Nobel Prize. His theory of relativity and the expansion of the universe led to the Big Bang Theory. But what was behind the Big Bang? Could it be that something was hidden wasn't a what, but a who? Something about the mystery and beauty of creation and its order kept bringing Einstein back to the idea that there must be a God. He said, we are in the position of a little child entering a huge library filled with many books in many languages. The child knows someone must have written those books. It does not know how. It does not understand the languages in which they are written. The child dimly suspects a mysterious order to the arrangement of the books, but doesn't know what it is. That, it seems to me, is the attitude of even the most intelligent human being toward God. Throughout his life, Albert Einstein, the man of science, would struggle with the idea of faith. He had been zealous in his Jewish faith as a child in Germany, but later turned away from it as a teen. Popular science books had convinced him much of the Bible could not be true. As an adult, he admitted that he was enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus, he said. His personality pulsates every word. No myth is filled with such life. Yet when asked the question, do you believe in God, Einstein could not produce a straightforward response. I'm not an atheist. The problem involved is too vast for our limited minds. Through all his searching, Albert Einstein, one of the greatest scientific minds of modern times, struggled and wrestled with the question of God. But in the end, he did not have faith. But it's the end that does matter. The Bible makes a distinction between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. The wisdom of the world is knowledge or power, but the wisdom of God is faith. 
In the end, it is only faith that matters. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.25 that even the foolishness of God is greater than man's wisdom. Later on in verse 27, Paul writes that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. But what is this foolishness? Could it be believing in something that can't be seen? Clinging to what Einstein called that something behind things, that something deeply hidden. Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Through his study of the universe, Einstein saw the evidence of something not seen, the evidence of God. His studies took him as far as science could go toward understanding the nature and presence of God. But science led him only to more theories and equations. What he needed was faith. Hebrews 11:6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. At times, all of us will struggle with our faith. There will be times when we see the hand of God evident in our lives. Then it will be easy to say that God exists and we believe in him. But there will also be times of hardship, times when the hand of God seems hidden. It is for these times that God gives us faith, the solid belief in His presence and His faith, even when we can't see Him. How do you handle your moments of doubt when you're searching? How do you face ideas and discoveries that challenge the foundations of what you believe? Do you allow them to be obstacles that threaten your faith or opportunities for your faith to grow? Yeah, I hope you kind of got that image of a child walking into a library because that perfectly describes the idea of what Paul's already said about general revelation. The fact that uh, we can know from creation that God exists and that he's eternal because he's got to be greater or more powerful than it and he's got to be all excited. But that's about as far as we can get. Through creation, we really can't know love, his redemption story, anything of his character and so forth. Uh, the first rhetorical question that Paul's going to deal with is one that he got often is, well, uh, if, if we, as being Jews, they would say, suffer the same fate uh, as everyone else, we need the same kind of uh, uh, solution to our salvation in terms of the Messiah dying for our sins, what advantage is there in being a Jew? And he says, yours is the great advantage because you have the, well, as New King James, the very oracles of God. You have the actual the scriptures themselves which is so, so, so much more than walking into the library as a child and having those books and knowing somebody must have written them. It's having somebody come and read them to you and introduce you to the author of the books. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot more. And Paul says that's a tremendous uh, advantage. Uh, again, it wasn't a frivolous uh, objection. Today we might uh, word it in Christian terms this way and say, if being affiliated with God's people through such things as baptism and church membership will not save us. And if having the word of God is not enough to ensure our salvation or holiness, what is the advantage of being un under, under the umbrella of the church and of Christianity? Is there an advantage? Well, I can tell you there's an, an advantage because there's so much that we can know from, from the scripture. Again, I grew up in a Christian home. It didn't make me a Christian. I went to all those youth groups. It didn't make me a Christian. I memorized the four spiritual laws. It didn't make me a Christian. I went to a Christian college, which kind of <laughs> kept me locked in a dorm and kept me out of a lot of trouble. It still didn't make me a Christian. I went to chapel every time it was required. It still didn't make me a Christian. What was the advantage? Because when I was 28 years old and at the end of my rope and in complete desperation, I knew there was a God. I knew that he died on the cross for my sins. I believed that if I got down on my knees and said what I knew was a sinner's prayer, that maybe he would save me and maybe he would forgive me. And I had enough faith to, to give it a shot. And God met me there and began to work in my life. I would say that was a tremendous advantage. But so, so Paul says, yes, there is advantage. You have the very oracles of God, uh, but they're going to come back with some, well, his anticipated rhetorical questions as well. But it begins... Uh, here in verse 2, again, we're in chapter 3 of Romans, completing this first section uh, in the book. And we would say first, uh, number one, it was a great profit for the Jewish people to have the word of God, or a great advantage, Paul would say. Verse 1, what advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. So our first rhetorical uh, question. 
uh, the Jewish people had the very word of God. And there's two things they knew about it. They knew would know about God, about his character, his characteristics, his holiness, as well as his love. The fact, though, that he does judge sin. They would know so much about God himself in terms of his character. After all, they had the, they had the, uh, the Torah, they had the law, they had the prophets, they had the poetical books, the historical books. Uh, they had so much going for them. Uh, at the same time, they also had a complete description of the nature of man and the, and the problem of sin and universal sin that separates us from God. And they had a sense, a remedy, that there needed to be a sacrifice for sin that they knew under that covenant. So uh, they knew a lot. There was a tremendous uh, advantage that they did have. They had God's word. They know what God is like. They know what they're like. And they know what God requires uh, we could certainly go into a lot of details about that, but Paul says that's a, that's a tremendous a, advantage compared to the person that simply has that external witness of creation and the internal witness of the conscience. Paul says that's enough to make all men without excuse, but the, the Jews themselves, man, to have the Bible, uh, to have the word of God, to have the covenants and the promises, it was a tremendous uh, advantage. Uh, they now go to uh, what he's going to consider as he proposes. And I, again, I don't think he's making up these rhetorical questions. I think these are the questions he had to deal with on a pretty regular uh, basis uh, in the synagogue. Uh, and he's going to say that the protest to this advantage uh, is uh, irrational. And that's in verses 3 to 8. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true. But every man a liar, as it is written, uh, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? If God un uh, is God unjust who inflicts wrath, I speak as a man, certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that, God, that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. So let's look at some of those rhetorical questions. The first one is, uh, what if some uh, did not uh, believe? Verse 3, will their lack uh, of faith nullify God's uh, faithfulness? Kind of a strange uh, uh, argument here, but again, I think one that he got on a regular basis. Paul, how can you possibly say we Jews have so completely failed in our privileged position and still insist that we're advantaged. Well, you're advantaged because you, uh, you have the word of God. Uh, the fact that you have failed to live up to the standards of God's law, because that's what he's saying and what he's leading to, is that the law, in a sense, Paul says, is our schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. It shows us how short we come. Uh, he says, how can God be fair in judging us? He gives us a standard. Nobody can live up to it. You say it's an advantage. How can God judge the world justly, in a sense? And again, I, I think these are the kind of arguments that Paul heard uh, on a regular basis. So what he does is he quotes Psalm 51 and basically says, your, your faithlessness will not undo God's faithfulness. Uh, let every man be a liar. God is still going to be true. Now, Psalm 51, the background is David and Bathsheba that we've already talked about uh, very recently. You remember Nathan goes to, to David uh, with that word picture that David could relate to as a shepherd and describes the very rich man with many flocks. And, of course, then uh, this, uh, this uh, family that raises a, a little lamb in their own home. Uh, the rich guy takes the lamb, basically prepares it, serves it to his guest. Uh, what should be done to the man that does this? David uh, flies off. He's angered. That man should be killed. He should have to pay for back, back four times in the mountain. Nathan basically then says, you, you are the man. And of course, David is convicted at that point. Now, again, uh, the reason that Nathan goes is so that David would repent, so that David could be restored, and so that David could hear the consequences of his sin. And there were consequences to it, and there are in our lives as a way to death. You and I, if we sin in this life, our sin is forgiven in terms of eternity. We have a righteousness of, in Jesus Christ, if we've come to faith in him. 
uh, but still it's not to say that there's not a price to be paid in this life for the sin we commit. But Psalm 51 is David's response. He, he writes two psalms in response to this whole thing with, with uh, his own repentance. One is, uh, is Psalm 32, uh, where he says, Your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the summer heat. And he describes God's conviction on his life all during that time before he confessed and renounced uh, his sin. Psalm 51, he's going through the same thing uh, and talking about how good God was to forgive him and how just God was in his judgment over him, which included the judgment of the death of his child that would die. And, uh, and uh, that's recorded for us in, in 2 Samuel, where David, David wept and prayed and he fasted that somehow maybe God would relent. But when he didn't and the child died, then David got up, had something to eat, uh, and went about his business. And it uh, certainly, uh, his servants didn't quite understand and David said, uh, you know, while he still had a breath in him, I prayed that God might intervene, uh, but he didn't. I'm receiving the just punishment that I deserve. And that wasn't it. Of course, David's family life was horrible from, uh, from that, uh, that point on. And that's, so Paul quotes David. And these guys would have been familiar with it. They hear the line. They know it's David. And even King David said, God is just in his judgments against me and my sin. So that's his point uh, there to that question. The second rhetorical question in verse 5, but if our unrighteousness, and you're saying we're unrighteous, circumcision doesn't save us, you know, being Jewish doesn't save us, going to the temple doesn't save us, all these things. If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God because his standard is up this high, what shall we say? Is God unjust? Who inflicts wrath? Again, all these arguments kind of run, run together. Uh, his, uh, uh, God says we have an advantage. Uh, he's showing the righteous standard and saying you failed. Isn't this somehow uh, unfair? His reply in verse 6, certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? You know better than, than that. Which leads to, again, these all kind of run together. The next rhetorical question uh, in verse three, uh, in verse seven, for if the truth of God is increased through my lie to His glory, why am I also judged uh, as a sinner? Uh, it's like saying, "Let us do evil that good uh, may come." Uh, Paul is—he's uh, saying they're saying, "Paul, what you're saying is that uh, uh, is actually an incentive for us to sin. If my unrighteousness shows how righteous God is." then the more unrighteous I am, the more righteous God seems to be. To him be the glory. I might as well just keep on sinning. And Paul says, listen, you're comparing apples and oranges. Your evil has no direct comparison with God's good. Uh, and it's a, a foolish argument. And he goes on to say, <laughs> and that's why you guys are condemned already. In fact, you, you say that I teach this. I don't teach this. Uh, and he, he deals with it a little bit later when he's trying to explain grace. And, uh, and the fact that we're saved, again, by God's grace, through faith, by God's grace. Uh, and he says, he makes a statement so that people could be assured of the fact that, that uh, no matter what they've done, God could still forgive them. So he says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So then the argument, great, if, if my sinning, increases God's grace, which is a wonderful thing, then let's sin more. So God's grace will increase all the more. And Paul says, that's absurd. You know, no, we don't go on, on sinning. And it leads to his whole discussion of what we refer to as a, a sanctification. Paul's point, your arguments are irrational uh, and they're foolish. And the truth is, our advantage, the advantage that we have is, is great because we have the self-revelation, the direct revelation of, of God. And uh, we'd be uh, amazed, uh, uh, you know, to, to even think of the idea of not having the Bible. What a tremendous advantage uh, it is, even for the unbeliever, even for a person like me, not accepting it, not following it, but having the knowledge of it at least. Because then when I came to a point of desperation, I knew what to do. I knew who to turn to. So he says it was a great profit for the Jewish people to have the word of God. Great advantage. The protest uh, of the advantage, he says, is irrational. Again, what advantage is there to be a Jew? Every advantage, we have the word of God. Will Jewish unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? 
Absolutely not. It actually establishes it. If our sins commend his righteousness, how can he judge us? Uh, because uh, you can't compare your evil with his good. God is the one who will in the end judge righteously. Do you feel like you're in a courtroom? <laughs> he's, ready, he's ready for his closing, closing uh, uh, arguments here. Uh, but uh, as he does this, he's going to do something very interesting that uh, the uh, rabbis did uh, in knowing the scriptures so well. To make their point, they would quote one scripture after another after another and just pull them out of different places in the Old Testament. It's actually called uh, uh, karatz, and it to, means to string pearls. Uh, and they're stringing pearls of scriptures together. And Paul's going to do this one after another after another uh, as he goes through verse 9 to 20 where we'd say there's an advantage despite the problem of universal sin. He says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles that they are all under sin, as it is written, and here he goes. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is no, none who understand. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. Uh, the poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The summary statement. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Let's go back. There's, the first thing we want to note is that he's saying there's no advantage in regards to the problem of sin, universal sin. Verse 9, what then are we better than they? Do we have a, a, an advantage? And the word sin, notice, is singular. It's not plural. It's not talking about some sins that they may have committed. It's talking about their very nature, their sin nature. And, uh, and Paul makes reference to this in Romans uh, 5.12. Where he says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. It doesn't help you, the fact that you've had the privilege. You've had the privilege. It was a privileged place. You've had the advantage, but you still need to be saved from your sin. Why? Because, because by your very nature, by our very nature, it sounds better for we're saying those guys, though, doesn't it, as opposed to us guys? I like it better to say, yeah, those guys, but it's us guys. Us guys, by our very nature, are sinful. Why do we sin? Does sinning make us a sinner? No, it doesn't. It only proves the fact that we are sinful. What's Paul's argument? If you see anybody living eternally around you, no, I'm pretty sure everybody is dying. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. In this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Adam, again, when he rebelled, and Eve took on a new nature, a sinful nature, and that got passed down in their spiritual DNA to their kids and their kids and their kids and, and uh, our very uh, existence. And that's Paul's point there. It doesn't matter how religious you are or non-religious. We're all in the same predicament in terms of, of universal sin. And, uh, and these guys uh, oh, had to either be really convicted at this point or really infuriated at this point because they know the scriptures that Paul is using and they probably don't like a lot of what he's saying. There's a lot of people today that don't like what Paul is saying at all. It's a big issue, isn't it? If, uh, if, you're, on the, if you're on the North Shore and there's a lifeguard and there's a riptide, if you don't ever call out for help, the lifeguard will never come help you. Uh, you know, we have to recognize our condition if we're going to be saved. Uh, and this is an uncomfortable thing for a lot of people. Now, over the years, I've had the privilege, based on your prayers, to go to hospitals and pray with people to receive the Lord. Uh, your moms and dads, your uncles and aunts, uh, and just a host of them over the years. Now, and in some occasions, then, do the do the funerals, the memorial service, is because in those settings it was right before uh, they were about ready to die. And they received the Lord. Uh, the people in the family that were Christians are, you know, hallelujah, you know, auntie received the Lord just, just in time. And uh, I just, you know, I didn't even do this in the first service. 
How many have had that experience where you, you've got a family member and they received the Lord right, right before they went to the Lord? There's, there's, there's quite a few of you, and I'm going to start pointing you out if you don't raise your hand, because I was the guy there uh, praying with them. But uh, the, uh, uh, in, at any rate, uh, uh, it's interesting what happened. You know, the Christians are rejoicing at that, uh, and in some cases, you have a lot of the family there are not Christians, right? And uh, they're still not sure what to make, make of it uh, and, and everything. And then I go do the memorial service, do the funeral, and I'll, I'll make reference to the fact as I'm trying to share the gospel, I'm trying to bring comfort uh, to the family. Uh, maybe I, I've gotten better at it, I don't know, uh, but I know early on, man, I got chewed out uh, on more than one occasion because I'd say something about, you know, uh, you know, auntie was a wonderful person and everything, but, you know, being wonderful isn't enough. Being a good auntie isn't enough. Being a good mother isn't enough. You know, she may have even gone to church, and she may have even gone had communion. She may have, but the important thing is every person in their lifetime must accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's a matter of placing our faith in him and what he's done, and I share, I share the gospel. And she did that in the hospital. I'm trying to assure them that she's with the heaven. She's with the Lord. She's in heaven today because she made that good confession. And we saw the joy that came into her heart and so forth. And I share that, you know, I go on. I get done. Christians are going, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I hope some more family members get saved. There's, there's a few of them, uh, maybe a time, times one, that will come up to me afterwards and say, are you saying my auntie's not a good person? I can't believe you said that right here at our funeral. She's a good person. She's the nicest person I've ever known. I can't believe. And I'm not exaggerating. Sometimes it's not in private. <laughs> and uh, it's like, get in. <laughs> it's like, sorry you feel that way. You know, yeah, I'm just trying to explain. But, you know, the main thing is she's with the Lord. Of course she's with the Lord. She's a good person. Yeah, but yeah. see, that's Paul's argument here. I mean, you, there's, there's people that believe they're going to be with the Lord because, you know, they've been pretty good people. But he, he just went through a litany of stuff and said, I don't think you really realize how bad you really are. One writer said, I don't know how bad the heart of a, an evil person is, but I, but I know the heart of a good person, and it's terrible. <laughs> Paul's trying to help us understand how great the gap is between our unrighteousness and God's righteous standard. And, uh, and it doesn't do us any good to say that not fair because that's what the, he's trying to bust through those those arguments and he's saying no it's a level playing field and uh, you guys had if, man if you've heard the gospel you got a bible you got a tremendous opportunity it's still the same for for everybody uh, he's dealing with again the problem of sin <laughs> secondly we kind of break this up and when he kind of goes through this litany of scriptures we would say he deals with character and then he does deals with conduct and then he's going to deal with the cause of the whole thing. And then he comes to a summary statement. But in terms of the character, in verse 10, he says, There is none righteous, no, not one. He's quoting Isaiah 64.6. Uh, if you read that in context and read the rest of it in Isaiah's uh, prophecy, uh, he's comparing the best, us on our best day. On our best day, our righteousness compared to God's standard is like filthy rags. Uh, and that, that's where this passage comes from. And, and uh, somebody might think, well, uh, I agree. I know some people like that, but I'm pretty sure I'm one of the exceptions. No, not even one. Uh, there, are, there are no exceptions. Uh, it's not a relative standard for righteousness. It is God's standard for righteousness, uh, and nobody uh, has, uh, has met it. And certainly we could look through the Gospels and the teachings of Jesus to, to help us understand that. You could go through the Sermon on the Mount. I love people that say they, they love the Sermon on the Mount and they love the Beatitudes. I'm pretty sure they've never read it or studied it because when I read it and study it, it just beats me up because uh, it's saying how I ought to be and I'm just not a lot like that, you know, and uh, it really works me over. You know, there's, uh, we could certainly go through the Ten Commandments, you know, if you have you ever, uh, you know, told a lie, well, just once, well, that makes you a liar. You know, we could go through all of that. I like what... Uh, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, where he's given a, a definition of love. Because if we're really righteous, I mean, we should be filled with, with God's love. And he gives the definition uh, here of love. And of course, if you haven't done it before, you could insert Jesus' name here. Jesus suffers long and so forth. Here's our description of a person that's very loving. Or you can insert, insert your own name, which I randomly wanted to pick some. No, I'll just insert my own. 
thought I'd see if I could make you nervous there. Tim suffers long in his kind. Tim does not envy. Tim does not parade itself. Uh, he's not puffed up. He doesn't behave rudely, does not seek his own, not provoke, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, rejoices in the truth, bears all things. Tim believes all things. Tim hopes all things, endures all things. Tim never fails. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> That's Paul's argument here. There is, there is no one. No, not even one. And then verse 11, and then he says, there's none that understand. Uh, none that really understand. Again, walking to that library, even if they can understand something of the attributes of God, uh, something of uh, the nature of themselves uh, in salvation, uh, we're still never going to, to get it because sin makes it impossible. Sin makes it impossible for us to really comprehend God. Have you ever tried to share about the things of God and your love for God and different things with someone who doesn't know the Lord? It's very difficult. It's very difficult for them to grasp what, you, what, you're, uh, what you're even saying. Paul makes reference to this in 1 Corinthians 2.14 where he says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. The Holy Bible cannot be understood apart from the Holy Spirit uh, indwelling us and, and awakening our, our spiritual eyes to be able to understand what's even being said. There's a lot of brilliant people that understand the Bible forwards and backwards in the New Testament can quote it and so forth as a historical book, as an interesting book, but it has no meaning to them and they can't really grasp. Paul says there's no one that really understands. The sin condition has done that to us and then he says something that a lot of people probably disagree with. There's none who seek after God. Uh, you know, it's, it's not in our, our nature. The word seek, uh, again, translated means uh, implying a determined search. Paul said that there's nobody that really makes a determined search. You know, we've, got a, uh, um, we've got church growth seminars that you can go to today to teach you how to minister to seekers. Well, Paul says there really aren't any. <laughs> I don't know if they read that passage or not, but uh, uh, there's really not any. You know, you, you may, you know, you, again, it's good to try to reach out to people that are a little more open to the gospel than, than others and, uh, and so forth. But Paul's saying there's really nobody that was really seeking. And this is kind of shocking sometimes. No, I, I sought the Lord very diligently, you know, and I read my Bible and I started going to church. I listened to Christian radio and, you know, I was seeking after God. Oh, good for you. Uh, actually, uh, if there was anything going on there, that was the work of the Holy Spirit in your life because you were in sin. You were dead in your trespasses and God, the Holy Spirit, came to you and began to draw you to uh, him, uh, himself and do that wonderful work. That's why sometimes when we're presenting the gospel, whether it's individually or to a group of people, and they seem kind of like open, seem kind of inclined, seem kind of interested in Jesus Christ and in, uh, in who he is. It's often very good to point out to them the fact that, that if something about this is resonating to you today, it's God, the Holy Spirit, that's speaking to your heart. It's not just preacher talk when we say those things. We're saying today might be your day. Today might be your only day. If this makes sense to you, if you recognize that you've got sin and you want it forgiven and you want eternal life, don't delay. That's God's spirit working in your heart. You're unable to get there on your own. God is working, drawing to yourself. Surrender to him now. It's not just preacher talk. It's the truth. There's no one that seeks God. That's, that's Paul's point here. Uh, and he's quoting Psalm 14. <clears throat> and the whole of that verse in Psalm 14, one says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. <clears throat> when I was growing up, uh, I, I would, if we used that word, that bad word that I just used, you know which bad word I just used? The fool. That is a bad word, according to my mother. Because the fool says in his heart. What does the fool say? Well, in italics, there is, though, the word there is is not there. In Hebrew, it just says, the fool says, no, God. That's what it says. And if we happen to use that word, that bad word, fool, uh, my mother's in heaven, so I can say it now. <coughs> the, uh, 
if we use that word to say maybe to call one of our siblings a fool, we got our mouth washed out with soap. I don't know if people do that anymore, but uh, it didn't even escalate to actual cursing. It was just things like this in the Bible. But uh, it was a, that's a terrible thing when a person is so foolish that they believe that they say no to God. That's Paul's point here. Verse 12, he says, they have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. Uh, because without the Lord, that's the logical outcome. <clears throat> Unprofitable means useless. It means without purpose. Uh, Paul's saying it's like a fish that cannot swim. It's like a bird that cannot fly. The very thing that God creates a person for, to have a relationship with him, they're unable. It's unprofitable. It doesn't matter what they uh, achieve in their life. And then he says, there is none who does good, no, not one. Now, obviously, people can do good things from time to time. But they can't do good things all the time. They can't do good things according to God's standard. They can't do good things according to God's standard with a completely pure motive in why they were doing them. Well, I bring flowers for the church every week. Does everyone know that? Well, of course they do. Well, maybe that's why you're doing it then. You know, we, you know even when we're doing something for the Lord, it could be uh, mixed motives. And by the way, if you're, if you're questioning that, don't worry about it. Let God sort it out in heaven. Just do stuff for the Lord. You know, you can drive yourself crazy with the idea of uh, uh, what motivates uh, your, own, your own heart. Uh, but the point is, there's none who does good. Uh, no, not one. And uh, by the way, I bring these flowers every week and <laughs> water them and take care of them. And... <laughs> Hawaii, we have silk flowers. Okay. <laughs> There's no advantage in regards to the problem of sin. He deals with the problem of the character of man. Uh, he's not going to let up. He deals with the conduct of man. That was in verses 13 uh, to 17. He focuses on human speech. He moves from uh, the throat to the tongue, uh, to the lips, and then to the mouth. He says their throat is an open tomb. That means you've got spiritually bad breath. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And again, this is still a bunch of religious people. You know, Paul is saying this, and he's quoting scripture. He's pulling this all out of the Old Testament. Psalm 5, 9, Psalm 10, uh, 7, Psalm 140, uh, verse 3. And we can look at this and say, man, I'm glad I'm not like that. But actually, the New Testament has a lot to say to us as believers in the same area. Uh, James chapter 3 is probably the classic, and certainly we won't spend the time going through all of it, but just a couple of the verses James says there, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Uh, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Talking to Christians there, James writing to uh, uh, a general epistle uh, out to uh, believers. And he says the tongue can't be tamed. Man, you can uh, go down to Thomas Square and watch uh, an obedience trial and be amazed at what those uh, dogs can do. You can take a trip down to Sea Life Park and uh, and see the dolphins, and man, that's amazing what they've uh, uh, taught them to do. And uh, he says, yeah, you know what's amazing? You can't tame your own tongue. It's a problem. Of course, the, to settle the issue, Jesus says it's out, of the, it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. The problem is the heart. So Jesus says you really need to, uh, to change the heart. He says the tongue is a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison, comparing it to a snake, much like Paul does here. <laughs> He says we can sit in church and we can praise God. And then afterwards on the way out, we can start putting people down and, uh, and uh, uh, just laying into them uh, with, with our tongues. Uh, his final uh, touch here, verse 15 to 17, sounds like a condensed version of history. He's quoting Isaiah 59. He says their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace, uh, they have not known. Uh, the idea of feet and so forth is a typical scriptural metaphor for one's approach to life. And here again, he's saying man is so depraved that he typically rushes to, to violence. And uh, you don't have to read too far, you know, on the news today or, or watch it to, 
to understand some of the atrocities that are being committed around, around the world. We're waiting right now to see if uh, uh, Basad Assad is going to launch uh, uh, chemical weapons against his own people. He's already killed thousands of them. Uh, will, it, uh, will it get worse? We'll, uh, we'll see. All of us know where the Sudan is now because we know of the genocide that's been committed primarily against, uh, against Christians and, uh, and uh, by the Islamic regime in Khartoum. Uh, as they uh, didn't want to waste the bullets, so they just slaughtered the people with machetes in order to kill them. Of course, they saved the women and children and sell them into slavery, and we could go uh, on and on. Uh, William Durant's book, Lessons from History, says that in the last recorded history of 3,421 years, there's been, as far as he can tell, 268 years that had no war somewhere. Uh, and Paul says here, in the way of peace, uh, they've not known. In other words, there's no contentment. There's no contentment uh, in life, quoting Isaiah 59.8. And we saw it in the news this week, again, when uh, professional athletes have uh, killed and, and been killed and taken the life of others. People that, in the eyes of a lot of Americans, had it all. They've, they've reached the pinnacle of their profession. They're uh, wealthy uh, as a result of it. They have all the notoriety that goes along with it. Uh, life couldn't get any better for them. Uh, and yet uh, there's no contentment. And uh, we're not surprised anymore when Hollywood types and rock and roll stars or whoever it might be, or the lottery winners, who we see win millions of dollars uh, in their lives become in shambled uh, in, the, in the ensuing years because there is no contentment in this life apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's, that's Paul's whole, whole point. And, uh, and it's, one, it's a tough lesson to learn. Uh, then he deals with the cause of the problem, verse 18, and this is it. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Why are people like this? They, they don't fear God. Again, Solomon said it's the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, it's the beginning of reason and logic and correct thinking. And if you don't have that registered there, things get real cloudy pretty, pretty quickly in terms of your, uh, of your thinking. How can people be so concerned about saving whales and dolphins, which is a good thing, but not be pro-life. I, see, I don't, I don't understand. That seems very illogical to me. It, you know, if one maybe would lead to the other, but uh, I don't understand. There's a lot of things that are irrational out there in our culture today. Uh, and Paul says uh, it's, the problem is we have no fear of God. Psalm 36, where Paul, uh, Paul is quoting, says... An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before, their, before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and, and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. All leading to Paul's uh, conclusion here in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty. How much all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now I mentioned Paul talking about the, the law being our schoolmaster that drives us to, to Christ, Galatians uh, 3.24. Uh, in the image there, uh, we think of a schoolmaster as the guy up front giving the lesson. <laughs> the schoolmaster was the, in the Roman culture, uh, was the slave that was kind of like the nanny uh, that would get the kids to school. Uh, and he would get to school, get them to school, and make sure they arrived to school by carrying a little stick. <laughs> and if the kids weren't moving along quick enough, they'd get a little shot, you know, to keep them uh, going. And um, I, don't, I don't think that'd go over real big today. But... Uh, uh, but that's what they did. That's the image. That's the image. He says the law is like that schoolmaster. It's kind of like giving us a little shot once in a while to make sure we're actually being driven to Jesus Christ, uh, our Lord and Savior, the only one that can save us from our sins. Uh, and uh, without it, we still have a conscience. Without it, uh, we still have the uh, witness of creation. But boy, with it, he says, uh, there is no excuse at all. Now, to not end on a down note, let's see where he's going. Look further down to verse 28 of our same chapter. As we would next week get into the, uh, the next section, he says, Therefore, 
and reference all this back because of everything he just said, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. That's how we're justified. Uh, it's it's the, uh, the step that Albert Einstein could not make. Interesting, isn't it? The guy's so brilliant. He knew there was something there and had to be something there. And he questioned what was there and it led him in his thinking. Uh, but uh, could understand the mathematical equations of the universe and know there had to be a designer of it, but could never make that step over to faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because it rewards those who, you know, again, earnestly seek him. And, uh, and we find that our seeking him it has so much uh, to do with what he's doing in our own hearts and very little to do what we're doing on our own. Again, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. NIV puts it this way. Through the law, we become conscious of sin. And because of that, then we are uh, drawn to the Savior. And uh, uh, again, we've, we've missed so much uh, in, our own, in our own culture because the Bible has been uh, driven from the public arena. We've got to remove the Ten Commandments you know, out of the classroom. Gee, we wouldn't want anyone to, to feel that uh, it's wrong to steal or it's wrong to lie. And we certainly wouldn't want to hurt. I think if this got read, it, I hope I haven't hurt your self-esteem. I should, should have said that beforehand because uh, Paul's uh, beating us up here. You know, for the first hundred years of our country, the primary textbook in every school was the Bible. That was the primary textbook for the first hundred years. Kids, like my kids, uh, learned uh, the alphabets with the Bible. A, all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Don't ask me to go past C. But, uh, but that's how they learned the alphabet. That's what kids did for 100 years. Because the law is the schoolmaster that will drive us to Christ. And we're missing it so much. Is there an advantage? Did they have an advantage having the word of God? Paul said, absolutely. You had the very oracles of God. But that's not enough to save you. It should be enough to lead you there. And it should be enough, as he quotes it, to convince them of universal sin. It's in our very nature, our spiritual DNA. And we all need a savior. And the only way we can have to bridge that gap is by our faith uh, in Jesus Christ what he's done for us on the cross. Let's pray.
surrender 